Thank you, Ray, for that excellent summary of the efficacy of ustekinumab. We're going to go forward and talk about um, safety as well as positioning and the novel IL-23s coming out. Let's start with safety, which is a very big uh, point in favor of this class of drugs. SOLAR, which is a real world safety of ustekinumab in psoriasis registry, is an observational study of over 12,000 patients who received ustekinumab as well as other psoriasis treatments. So this was a registry in psoriasis patients. And they looked at assessments of adverse events, including malignancy, cardiac events, serious infection, and all-cause mortality. And they found very low rates of complications, including malignancy, MACE, which is a major adverse cardiovascular events at 0.33 per 100 patient years, serious infection, and mortality. And they found no increase in any of these with ustekinumab. Now, recently at UEGW 2020, they presented the five-year UNITY data, which was safety findings through week 52, uh, through week 252 of patients who entered the long-term extension. And here you look, you can see the patients receive placebo sub-Q, 90 milligram sub-Q every 12 weeks or every eight weeks, as well as, and then in the final column, the combined ustekinumab group. The average duration of follow-up was about 200 weeks plus or minus, and um, there were six deaths overall in the ustekinumab group. There were no new deaths reported after week 156. The number of specified events per 100 patient years um, for adverse events was similar uh, across the different ustekinumab groups and was much less than the placebo group. The same for serious adverse events, which was 17.3 um, in the combined ustekinumab group versus 20 in the placebo group. Infections were also lower at 93 in the combined group versus 103 in the uh, placebo group and serious infections was um, similar as well. There were six patients who had malignancies, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer in the weeks 156 through 272. Um, there was an intraocular melanoma and a renal cell carcinoma, endometrial adenocea, another melanoma, breast cancer in site two, and a pancreatic carcinoma. Now, uh, a study that has been getting some attention um, positive and negative was this from the JAMA network from dermatology, looking at severe cardiovascular events among patients exposed to ustekinumab. And what they found was that if you um, were high risk for a cardiac event, which they described as patients with more than two cardiovascular risk factors or a history of severe cardiovascular events, then if you started ustekinumab, you were four times more likely um, to have a, another serious MACE event. Um, there have been some questions regarding how the study was done, and, um, but it is something to keep in mind. This was not seen in SOLAR and this was not seen in the UNITY study. We, um, as we discussed, ustekinumab has a lower rate of serious infection as well as tuberculosis compared to the anti-TNFs. So um, in certain populations or those with the positive quantiferon that you need to treat, but you need to start on therapy right away, ustekinumab is a good option in those patients. Um, ustekinumab also has a very low rate of immunogenicity. In the UNITY trials, it was 2% at week 44. So you're highly unlikely to get neutralizing antibody with ustekinumab. And even better, uh, you don't really need an immunomodulator. So this study suggested that among ustekinumab and vedolizumab patients, the addition of immunomodulator did not have any impact on clinical response or remission. So low formation of antibody and no need for an immunomodulator. Ustekinumab also is appropriate for use in pregnancy. Uh, data so far in 206 pregnancies showed uh, no association with an increase in congenital anomalies or miscarriage. Of course, data uh, collection is ongoing here. When we look at safety of all of the different agents, um, the TNF inhibitors 
are, are very effective agents. Um, they can have common uh, reactions, including injection site reactions, headache, rash, et cetera, um, and rarely lupus-like syndrome, but they have a boxed warning for serious infection and malignancy. Ustekinumab um, can have common um, reactions such as injection site reactions, pruritus as well, as well as very rarely reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome, but there is no boxed warning. Same for vetalizumab, no boxed warning. Tofacitinib um, does have boxed warnings for serious infections, mortality, malignancy, and thrombosis. So if you have a patient with multiple comorbidities, this is something to keep in mind. So taking into account the efficacy of the various agents, as well as their safety profile, how do you approach deciding what drug to choose? Efficacy is always important and the TNF agents are very effective to induce and maintain remission and have a rapid onset of action. Um, infliximab in particular has a decreased rate of colectomy. However, the cons are that they're more immunosuppressive with a greater risk of systemic infection, a small but increased risk of lymphoma and the need for concomitant immunomodulators. The tofacitinib class is a pill which can be very favorable with patients. Um, it's effective in TNF naive as well as experienced patients with rapid onset of action. It's well tolerated and um, has a short half-life. The cons are the increased risk of infection, um, the risk of PE and DVT, and the high creatinine kinase levels. Um, again, we have to point out that the risk of um, thromboembolic um, events seems to be low in the ulcerative colitis patients and the data prompting the black box warning came from rheumatoid arthritis patients. Ustekinumab, the pros are that it's effective in TNF exposed patients, particularly in ulcerative colitis, low immunogenicity and low rate of infection and malignancy. Cons, possible risk of non-melanoma skin cancer, the um, question of cardiac events and psor psoriatic arthritis patients, and the unclear efficacy in perianal disease. Um, Vetalizumab effective in TNF naive patients selected to the gut with low immunogenicity with the cons being modest effect size and no impact on extra intestinal manifestations. So what is my approach to choosing a biologic for my patient? I look at efficacy and I look at safety. If I have a severe hospitalized patient or someone with severe fistulizing disease, I am going to choose infliximab. That's where we have the best data. If I have a bio-naive patient with ulcerative colitis, I will pick um, infliximab, ustekinumab, or betalizumab. If I have a bio-naive patient with moderate to severe Crohn's disease, I will pick an anti-TNF, ustekinumab, or betalizumab. However, if I have a TNF failure patient, I will pick ustekinumab for UCCD or tofacitinib for UC based on clinical trial data. With respect to safety, vetalizumab has the best safety profile followed by ustekinumab. TNF, inhib him oh, sorry. TNF inhibitors and tofacitinib have similar safety profiles and again, have excellent efficacy. So you have to weigh that in your patient. Certain special situations are the older patient where you may have multiple comorbidities and that's where ustekinumab and betalizumab would be preferred. For the patient considering conception, I would use any of these agents except for tofacitinib, tofacitinib particularly in the first trimester. And if patients have particular comorbidities, if they have a history of VTE, I'm going to avoid tofacitinib. If they have demyelinating disease, I'm going to avoid an anti-TNF. If they have spondyloarthropathy, I'm going to prefer an anti-TNF as that's where our best data is. So what about some of the newer IL-23 agents currently under investigation for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? So ustekinumab hits the P40 subunit, which is shared by IL-12 and IL-23. Turns out IL-12 is not that helpful to block. So the newer agents block the P19 subunit of IL-23, and this includes gazilkumab, mirikizumab, rizinkizumab, and brizikumab. 
Um, as we said, ustekinumab is an IL-1223. It's FDA approved for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as well as uh, psoriasis. Um, Gazilkumab is in phase 2-3 in Crohn's disease and is approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Mirakizumab is in phase 3 for UC and CD. And Rizinkizumab is in phase 3 for CD and phase 3 for UC and is also approved for psoriasis. Gazilkumab um, phase 2 uh, data was recently um, shown at UEGW. And interestingly, they did have an ustekinumab arm in purple. And in the overall population, you can see that all the different um, drug doses did show efficacy, uh, including in patients who had failed a biologic, though it wasn't as good in those who had just failed conventional medication. Mirakizumab showed efficacy for ulcerative colitis at week 12. Um, as in this phase two study. And you can see that there's efficacy for induction of clinical remission. Um, there was a maintenance trial looking at clinical remission as well and endoscopic remission. Serenity, the Serenity study looked at Merikismab as induction therapy for Crohn's disease and showed efficacy. Rizinkizumab um, was also effective in anti-TNF treated Crohn's disease patients. And uh, was effective for maintaining clinical and endoscopic remission and response up to week 52 in Crohn's disease. Brzezikamab, I don't think is currently under trials, but did show some efficacy for Crohn's disease. So in summary, the anti-IL-1223 therapy ustekinumab is effective for induction and maintenance of remission in Crohn's disease. Um, Anti-IL-1223 therapy is also effective for induction and maintenance of remission in ulcerative colitis. It has an excellent safety profile. We do need to understand better the finding of increased MACE events in high-risk cardiovascular patients with psoriasis, but all data in inflammatory bowel disease suggests that it is a very safe agent. Um, and multiple novel IL-23 agents are coming and it'll be interesting to see what their efficacy is and their safety profile is compared to ustekinumab. Thank you. And now uh, we will move on to some cases.